Let's say you've been exposed to a virus. The most common ones around right now could be something like coronavirus, which is responsible for COVID-19, or influenza, which is responsible for the flu, or even rhinovirus, which is responsible for the common cold. Anyhow, those virus particles enter your body. Typically that happens through your nose or mouth. A virus particle is just another name for an individual virus entity. It can also be called a virion. So the virus particles enter your body and then start to replicate. You get sick, become contagious, and potentially pass that virus on to others. Let's take a look at what happens in that time in between when you first get infected to when you become contagious and potentially infect others. This is the virus life cycle. To keep things as simple as possible, I'm going to break the virus life cycle down into three stages. Entry, replication, and shedding. But before I get there, I want to give you a quick reminder of what human viruses look like. There's a protein capsule that holds genetic material. Could be DNA, could be RNA. It just depends on the virus. Then for some viruses, there's a membrane around the protein capsule. And for others, there's no membrane but they all have these receptor proteins around the outside. All right, after a virus enters the body, there are a couple of ways that that virus can gain entry to a host cell. And again, it just depends a little bit on which virus we're talking about. One way is through the process of endocytosis. So here we have the example of the influenza virus, where the virus particles approach a cell and create an infolding in that cell membrane. The influenza virus particle is then taken into the cell. This process of endocytosis can happen for both membrane-bound viruses and for viruses that lack a membrane. Another way a virus can gain entry to a potential host cell is through the process of membrane fusion. This mode of entry only works for membrane-bound viruses. This could include viruses like the coronavirus or herpes, or rotavirus, or rabies virus, and lots more. Now, remember that a cell membrane isn't a rigid structure. It's fluid, constantly moving and changing. It gets continually replenished from organelles within the cell, and it constantly loses little parts of itself as various molecules are exported from the cell in membrane-bound vesicles. It's this dynamic and fluid property that virus particles can take advantage of. A membrane-bound virus can fuse with the membrane of a host cell so that it can gain entry into that cell. So those are a couple of examples of entry. Now let's look at replication. Once a virus particle enters a cell, the membrane and protein encasing that genetic core gets broken open. Sometimes the viral genetic material has within it the instructions to make its own viral DNA polymerase or RNA polymerase. These viral polymerase enzymes play a role in replicating the viral DNA or RNA along with the help of proteins from within the host cell. Other times, the viral DNA can travel to the host cell nucleus and make use of the host cell's DNA replication machinery. As the genetic material is replicated, processes called transcription and translation are initiated, which produce new viral proteins. The viral proteins and the newly replicated viral genetic material come together and are used to build new virus particles. Here's another picture of it. Actually, here, let's go from entry to replication right into the final step called shedding. This occurs after the virus components are copied and synthesized and assembled. All right, here we go. A virus particle approaches a cell. It gets engulfed by the cell and releases its viral RNA, in this example, into the cell. Some of the RNA is copied and some of it is synthesized into protein. In this example, the virus particle components are synthesized into a cellular organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. And you can see that there's a budding vesicle that's coming off of one side of that endoplasmic reticulum. That membrane-bound vesicle then travels to another cellular organelle called a Golgi apparatus. The vesicle fuses with the Golgi, and then within the Golgi, the virus components are modified. 
and then packaged into a new vesicle that comes off of the other side. This new vesicle then travels to the cell membrane and fuses with it, which allows the viral particle contents to be released into the surrounding intercellular space, where those particles can then go on to infect surrounding uninfected cells. This particular mechanism of shedding is called exocytosis, and it works great for viruses that are not bound by an outer membrane envelope. For viruses that do have an outer membrane envelope, like the coronavirus, a different process is sometimes used called membrane budding. In this example, a viral capsid forms inside the cell and then travels to the cell membrane. As it reaches the membrane, it pushes out and creates a tiny outfolding. This results in a membrane-bound virus particle that's stolen a tiny part of the outer cell membrane from the host cell. The final way that viruses can escape from host cells is through cell destruction. In animal cells, sometimes there's a defense response where the cell recognizes that it's infected and undergoes a process called apoptosis, which is a way that the cell can destroy itself. On one hand, this is great because the virus can no longer use the cell's machinery to copy itself. It essentially shuts down the cell as a virus-making factory but on the other hand, it means that any complete virus copies that have already been made end up getting out of the cell where they can then go on and infect surrounding cells. So there's your brief snapshot of the virus life cycle in animal or human cells. Now, there can of course be a little bit of a time lag between when someone is first infected to when their cells are shedding significant quantities of the virus particle. It just takes a little bit of time for those processes of entry, replication, and shedding to occur. As shedding starts to occur en masse, it can stimulate symptoms like fever, coughing, diarrhea, vomiting, and so on. Many of those symptoms, fever is a great example, are linked to your body's immune response in trying to combat the virus. And of course, many of those symptoms can result in a virus getting spread from one host to another. So if you do get infected with a virus and as your symptoms start to emerge, now at least you know a little bit of what's going on at the molecular level. Be sure to check out the other videos in this series to learn more about viral genetics, about how vaccines work, and about how viral immunity works. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.